And at that time, I told you there was some special guest in our service. And those special guests have made another appearance. And I have some of my family down here with me. This is my daughter, Chrissy, my granddaughter, Ava, my grandson, Maddox, and my son-in-law, Dustin. Now, the last time that I told you when I was here that Ava was my favorite granddaughter. She's two years older than she was the last time. She looks like she's a little bit more than two years older. But let me ask you a question, Ava. Why are you my favorite granddaughter? She's my only granddaughter. <laughs> my daughter is my favorite daughter because she's my only daughter. And my son-in-law is my favorite son-in-law because he's my only son-in-law. Maddox, you're out of luck. There's six of you. <laughs> I have six other grandchildren. I have six boys. So that's it. Christmas was exciting. So, but we are delighted that you are here today. And um, the Bible says, and I want to read a scripture, and then I want to go back to the surrounding verses of that scripture. And this scripture is not new to us. We who have been saved and we who are Christians, it is our desire that we be good followers and good disciples of the one who saved us. And in Luke chapter 9, I think that I have that up on the, on the board there. We're not going to look at 18 right yet. But in verse 23, then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, he had to throw that one in there. I can do that maybe several times a year. But our Lord, through the inspiration of the Spirit, wants us to take up our cross daily and to follow Him. Follow me. Now, the setting in which this appears... A lot of preachers or a lot of teachers, they like getting up here and they take a favorite verse. And you can almost make that verse say anything that you want it to say. And I could give you four or five things from this verse why we're going to be different in the new year. And we could all rally up and we could get all excited. And I'm going to do this, this, and this in the new year, and my life is going to be different. Anybody ever done that? Last about a week. And then you go, you know what? The next 51 weeks are going to be different. <laughs> and about two or three weeks later, you make another statement, and you realize that the only way that I can do this is a day at a time with all that mighty God's help. Amen. And I want to tell you something this morning. And miracles happen in this place. Two years ago, there's a little blonde haired little lady right here, name known as Christella. She's my wife. 
and she sings. And I'm her husband. And some of you call me Samuel. Some of you call me Sam. And some of you call me Sammy. And a lot of you call me Pastor Sammy. I like the way that sounds. But I want you to know two and a half years ago, three years ago, we had no idea. We lived right across the street. I came in and I don't want to ever forget to tell this when I'm up here. This church, people like Mike Sieber, people like Rot, people like Jason Robertson took a family with a guy who had many struggles in my past. I was able to get married, and it is a complete miracle that I get to stand before you today. Yeah. <laughs> so with that said, let's talk about his story. So the setting around this is in, in, in the book of Luke. And I don't want to just bring a verse unto you. I'm going to get back at verse at number 18 in a minute in this chapter. But if you were to open your Bibles this morning and you started in the book of Luke, you would read many things that took place. And if you went through the synoptic gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, in Luke, you would see the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. In this particular chapter, or in this particular gospel, it is the ministry that he had be that began in Galilee. Galilee. It was called the Galilean ministry. And we see that part of that ministry, he was rejected in Nazareth. His very own people rejected him. However, there had never been anyone seen like this man. He was different. He was unique. And they wondered, where is he from? He started to cast out unclean spirits. They were in people. He healed Peter's mother-in-law who had been sick. And many times at night, after the Sabbath sunset, he healed many. He called for fishermen, and then he called some more. Jesus would clean a leopard. Jesus would forgive and heal. He taught us about fasting. In other words, in the multitudes, when people were sick, crippled, blind, couldn't speak, he healed them. Then one day there was a funeral procession coming through and he stopped it. And there was a widow of Nain there and he caused her son to come alive. Now I guarantee you if there was a funeral possession that came in here today and Pastor Jason went out there and made that person come alive, I might say, I'm out of here. <laughs> but there wasn't, that one who made that person come alive wasn't just any normal person. He was the Son of God. He taught us about Beatitudes. And right at the end 
of what I'm about ready to say. He fed 5,000 people. Now, if we brought a bunch of people over to your house and welcomed in the New Year's tonight, and I don't think that we could really take care of 500 people, do you? So that brings us to verse number 18. And may I develop this a little bit more? We're not dealing with an ordinary man. We're dealing with God. And if there has been a miracle in your life today, it is because of God. Look what he says. Verse number 18, chapter 9. And it happened as he was alone praying that his disciples joined him and he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? Well, you just heard some of the stuff that he did. And Jesus looks to his disciples and he says, who do the crowds say that I am? And there was the response. Some say that you're John the Baptist. Some say that you're Elijah. Others say that you're one of the old prophets that came from the dead. If you look over in chapter 7 of the same chapter, Herod was a little bit perplexed too. He didn't know who this guy was. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was done by him. And when he heard these things, he was perplexed. And he ventured out and asked those people, you go bring Jesus to me. I want to see him. And I want to meet him. Stay with me. Then all of a sudden, he narrows the crowd down. He's no longer talking to the multitudes or to the crowds. He makes a statement. And he said to them, who's them? His disciples. But who do you say that I am? Peter, good old Peter, answered and said, the Christ of God. Do you remember in Matthew, in chapter uh, 16, you will find this story in all three places in the gospel, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But Peter made a bold confession. He is the Christ of God. Whom do you say Jesus is this morning? Let's narrow it down even further. Who do you individually say that Jesus is? You can't get away from that question. His name demands an answer. I don't care who you are. If you're in a recovery meeting, 
Half of them don't like that name. You know why? Because that name requires an answer. Whom do you say that Jesus is this morning? Let me, let me just read what Peter said. He said to them, but whom do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, in Matthew, not Mark, not Luke, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven, who is in heaven, has revealed this to you. If you are sitting in this auditorium this morning and you have been born again, if you have been redeemed, you have been regenerated, you like Peter can say, my Father in heaven has caused that to happen. Not by flesh or blood. I didn't read the whole verse. But your Father, which is in heaven, sent His Spirit through the preaching of the Gospel and He knocked on your door. And you had to answer that question. Who is Jesus? Amen. Who is Jesus? Now, Peter is getting ready to get all excited. But all, he's going to get the air knocked out of here, him in, here in a minute. Good old Peter. He, in other words, he says, you're the anointed one. You're the Messiah. You are the one that God sent. And all of those Jewish people back there, and the 12 disciples, man, they were all excited. The Savior has come, and all the Roman oppression, and all the stuff that they were going to go through was going to end. Then he startles them. He strictly warns them and commands them to tell no one. Excuse me? I'm supposed to be a witness, Jesus. They did not understand what was coming. What does it mean? <clears throat> Who is Jesus in your life? What does that mean? And he strictly warned them in verse 21. Everybody awake? Yep. May you hear the spirit of the word of God this morning. And this is what he said to them. He commanded them and said, tell no one, saying, the Son of Man must suffer. The Son of Man must be rejected. And the Son of Man must be killed. Do you honestly think that the disciples at that point were startled? <laughs> Come on! This is the Savior of the world. To be rejected? 
Did you notice the word in verse number 22, the son of man must, must? That is an emphatic must. The son of man must suffer. The son of man must be rejected. The son of man must be killed, but he will rise again the third day. I know no better hope than that. Still, why must the Son of Man die? That's probably why what they were wondering. Otherwise, Peter wouldn't have rebuked him. If Peter understood that thing totally, he would have never rebuked him. Then, man, I'm glad I wasn't there that day. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. I'm not so sure that Peter's was done fairly that day by people like you and I. I think not only was he correcting Peter because he remembered that there was a time when he was in a desert place. Satan says, you, you turn those stones into bread. You go to the pinnacle of the temple and jump off and I'll save you. You're the son of God. You're hungry. Make those rocks bread. You're Jesus. He says, he took him to the temple, the highest place. Fall down and worship me. I'll give you everything that you want. Hmm. You know why he had to suffer? You know why? He must suffer. Let me give you a few reasons. He suffered for you and for me. He stood in for his people. He would suffer for our wickedness. He didn't have any wickedness. And he suffered. He would stand and take place of the guilty sinner. He would be rejected for me. He would take my shame. He took your shame. He wasn't worthy of nothing except praise. He stepped in for the full payment of your sin and secured your eternity. He died that I could live. He died that you could live. So the hundred years perhaps that we get to live on this earth. It's no wonder that scripture is written. To be absent in the body is to be present with our Lord. I don't know. That excites me. But I want you to know this morning, just as he made his disciples aware that day. Don't think that being my disciple and my follower that it's going to be a walk in the park. Things are going to be great. No problems. Hey, no big deal. You know what? I got everything I need. I got good health. I got wealth. I got prosperity. I've got, turn on the TV. 
You can have it. You got it all. I'm not sure that that was the message that Jesus was portraying, nor is it the message from his word that I'm telling you this morning. You want to be a follower of Jesus? I don't know what's going to make you better in 2024, but I know that you will, what will make you better day after day after day. One day at a time. What does he say? And I'll, I'll run through these. You've heard them. There's only three things left to tell you this morning. And we're back to that verse. I think it's 23, but I want you to notice something here. There is verse number 22 or verse number 23. Did you notice? I want you to notice in there. Then he said to them, all or anyone... Who is the all or the anyone? Us. What are the requirements? If you desire or if you wish, they're right in there. Look at them. Don't think that I'm just telling you. Verse number 22. Verse number 23, sorry. Then he said to them all, if anyone desires or wishes, what's the qualifications to be a disciple and follower of Jesus? He wants you to know it's going to cost you something. Put your name in there. Put your name in there where the anyone is. If Richard wants to be my follower and come after me. If Cindy Wentworth or any other Cindy in here wants to be my follower, you put your name in there. If Mike Clark if Sam Davis, if Pastor Jason Robertson wants to be my disciple and come after me, he must do three things. Do I have to do them? Obviously not. I have to have a desire to do them. I must wish to do them. I think that that's what it says right there. If you desire, God has saved you. You are born again. You have the gift of eternal life. You're going to heaven. Does that mean that you don't have to do anything for Jesus? I don't think he required me to do all the things it means to follow him as Lord to be saved. He's got to become my Lord before I can follow Him as my Lord. But if you desire Him this morning, and if you wish to follow Him, He gives us three necessary things. Number one, verse number 23, the first one is deny himself. I'm not denying myself, probably most of the time. Are you kidding me? You think I'm going to deny myself? Do you not know who I am? You mean to tell me I, miss, I need to disown me? To follow him, I'm not talking about sonship. I'm talking about discipleship. Two different things. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about growing in sanctification. 
I must separate myself from myself. Maybe that's a good thing. I wish that I would have done that sooner many times. You mean to tell me I almost have to be like Peter when he says, I don't know Jesus. You know what I need to do? I don't know myself. Because in myself, there dwells no good thing. I have to cast myself away. It seems funny saying that. What it basically comes down to, I have to say no to some things. I don't want to. I don't either. But, and now keep in mind, I don't know of any perfect disciples to you. That's not what I'm saying. You're not, you don't have to go get a horse and buggy, put on a black hat, have short pants come down to your ankles, guys, and put on a black suit. They're probably a whole lot more godly than a lot of us. But I, I'm going to tell you something. If you love Jesus, I'm not asking you to crawl in your closet or in your house and detach yourself from the world. Jesus, we're going to talk about that in a minute. He didn't, when he says to die, I think today, because back then, the cross meant that you were carrying your execution thing to your death. You weren't coming back. You were going to die and you were going to die. And it just wasn't carrying a burden. You were carrying the thing that you were going to die on. That was the cross. I don't know how I got off on that. But I want you to know you have to learn to put Jesus first. I do not want to entertain myself with the things that Jesus died on the cross to forgive me of. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. I deliberately, I don't want to make Jesus Christ number one in my life. I want him to be my life. Amen. He's way too quiet in here today. <laughs> I'm either making some people mad or you're agreeing with me. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. What does it say in Galatians 4.22? I know a little bit about that book. It says we have taken off that old man and Christ has put on a new one. We must deny ourselves. The second one is to take up your cross. Now, let me tell you something. What does that mean? That does not mean or is it talking about bearing a cross, although that might have something to do with it? Your mother-in-law is not your cross to bear. <laughs> she might think that you're a cross to bear. <laughs> what I'm saying is that it doesn't necessarily have to be an illness. Bad marriage, something in life has happened. Problems, financial problems. It's all piled up on you. But let me tell you what it means. The taking up your cross means that Jesus Christ is the center of your everything. 
When I get up in the morning, it's Jesus. At noon, it's Jesus. And at night, it is Jesus. And what I most must do, and it talks the cross, talks about death. I must kill some things in my life daily, Amen. or they will kill me. Number one, I must deny myself. We get that one. I, might, I must take up my cross. That means that I surrender my life every single day to the purposes of God. He is my every now moment. Every moment. I die to pride. I die to self. I die to my dreams. I die to my hopes, my plans, and my wants. Does that mean I must not have any of those things? No. They just shouldn't be the most important thing in your life. Our Savior is the most important thing in our life. All he wants is the rule and the reign in your life as Lord. I must deny myself. I must take up my cross daily. I'm pretty good at it a few times a year, but daily. I don't know about that. Number three, and I'm done. It says, follow me. Follow me. Follow me. Now, what does that mean? It means to follow him. I went to Bible college to learn that. What does it mean to follow Jesus? It means to follow him. My daddy was alive. He'd say, I paid all that money for you to learn that. Yep, dad. Matthew 7, 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them. I, he will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. Floods came, whatever else came, tornadoes, whatever, some earthquakes out here. It beat on that house and it fell not. Why? Because it was built on Jesus Christ. The first thing about following him, you have to follow what his word tells you. The second thing, most of us today want to believe without obedience. I'll do this, Jesus. I'll do this, Jesus. And all that Jesus asked when you come is just believe and be obedient. Sometimes that's hard to do. What does it mean to follow him? It means to follow him. It means that you seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things shall be added unto you. It means that you are to be obedient children and not be conformed to the evil's desires that you once had. And it's hard to separate all of these three things of denying yourself, taking up your cross, and follow them because they all really connect in your life. They're all interwoven. They're there. Who do you say that Jesus is? You want to follow Jesus? Stay close. To the Lord. What happened to Peter when he didn't stay close to the Lord? I think he was warming his hands in the enemy's camp, sitting next to a fireplace. If you get too close, you just might deny your Lord. Could happen. Keep close to him. Keep your eyes on him. Evelyn today was in the conference room. She says, you know what? 
I need ears to hear, eyes to see. How true is that? Somebody can tell me something time and time again, but all of a sudden, I'll hear it. I may have heard it from you, but you saying it to me makes a difference. You want to do something different this year? I'm not asking you to make any New Year's resolutions because most of them, some of them, I don't want to say all of them, may disappear. They'll do a Houdini on you. But day by day by day in 2024, I want to deny myself with the power of the Holy Spirit to help me do that. I want to take up my cross and I want to follow him. I pray and hope that is, that is our desire this new year is just to get closer to him day by day and we'll ask his spirit to keep teaching us week after week the things of the Lord. I'm done. I appreciate you listening. I hope you'll come back next week and hear Pastor Jason. He will be back with us. His family is in town. His mother-in-law is in town, by the way. Hope he's not listening to that tape. <laughs> but um, he'll be back next week. And we do have a couple announcements before we leave. Business as usual, starting Monday, Tuesday. It is the New Year's Monday. Football games, you people are going to watch all those football games. But on Tuesday, we pick back up just preaching and teaching and witnessing and loving one another. And am I forgetting anything else? The Bible studies are going to take place on, uh, there probably won't be one Monday, will there? Seeing that it's New Year, but the heart of the gospel will be on Tuesday night.